the BBC presents Robert Beatty as Philip O'Dell in Lady in a Fog, a serial in eight parts by Lester Powell. Part one, presenting Philip O'Dell. This all began in a bar, the way so many things begin with me. Sometimes I think I'll stay out of bars and so keep out of trouble, but somehow I never seem to get round to it. Well, this little bar was in Half Moon Street, just off Piccadilly, and it had soft glamour lighting and thick carpets and an air of refined indulgence. A nice little place if you happen to like that kind of place. I do. The name's Odell, by the way, Philip Odell, Irish, of course, like most true Irishmen, I spent the best part of my life keeping away from the old country, mostly in North America. But I mean to go back someday. In fact, I was actually on my way when this happened. I had my seat booked on the plane, my bags packed and everything. And then what must I do but go and call up Heather McMara? Hello? Heather, this is Odell. Am I still your favorite man? Where did you spring from? <laughs> Germany. I just got in this morning. You were the first person I thought of. Could we uh, kick it around a bit tonight, do you think, in celebration of this great moment? I don't see why not. Where shall we meet? Well, what about the old place in Half Moon Street? Lovely. I'd be there at 7 sharp. I'd better explain a couple of things about Heather McMara. She had soft auburn hair and a pair of greenish eyes that a man could easily lose his banknotes in. And she had no sense of time whatsoever. The result was that I spent a full half hour in this bar, dangling my feet and thinking of nothing in particular. And then a little fat guy came in, ordered a double brandy, gulped it down, and went out again as if all the characters in Edgar Allan Poe were on his heels. After this, the barman came over to where I was sitting and said, Does that every night he does. Always a double. Never says a word. Ops in and ops out. Extraordinary. Perhaps he likes silence with his brandy. Oh, more to it than that. Much more. But he's running away from something. Something inside his mind. How do you figure that out? I can always tell. Watch people sum them up. Never wrong. Astonishing the way I do it. You're uh, new here, aren't you? Three months. I thought I hadn't seen you before. Uh, give me another scotch, will you? Right, sir. Have one yourself. Thanks. Kind of you. Yes, I can sum a person up without even speaking to him. Here's your scotch. Thanks. Keep mine till after. Here's luck. I summed you up in the first ten minutes I did. You did? I did. You're Irish. You've got one of them long, humorous faces women go for. Dress well, too. Especially tonight. Therefore, you're waiting for a woman. How do you do it? Gift. Had it all my life. Tell you something else. This woman you're waiting for, she ain't your wife. No? No. You shaved this evening. No man shaves twice a day for his wife. <laughs> Sounds reasonable. Uh, cigarette? Thanks. Keep it till after. Another thing. You're either a writer or an investigator of some sort. Now, how do you know that? You listen. Only writers and detectives do that. The rest talk. Do they? Your girl's just come in. 45 minutes late. You uh, haven't had time to sum her up, I suppose. Don't say that. Looks like she enjoys life. Yeah, I'd predict you was in for a good evening with her. Very good. Thanks. I'll go and see if you're right. Oh, there you are, Odell. Hey, Angel. Oh, it's good to see you. Now, where would you like to sit? A table or a stool at the bar? A table, I think. I'd hate to waste all the work I've put in in my front view on a barman. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be wasted on that barman. He's the original magic eye. He sees beneath the surface. In that case, a table, definitely. Oh, this'll do nicely. A good long way from the bar. He won't get away from the barman. He serves the tables as well. Oh. Now, what'll it be? Something with gin, I think. Well, how are you, Angel? It's a long time, you know. Too long. You're one of the few men in my life I can bear to see more than once a year. Double scotch and a dry martini. His intuition is wonderful, Odell. Dry martinis, just what I want. Thank you, madam. I never miss. Oh, here's to you, Angel. Cheers. Do you, um, like that barman? I think he's sweet. You wouldn't, uh, want him to go home tonight and feel that his day's been a failure, would you? 
What do you mean? Well, he predicted we were going to have a good evening together. He prides himself on always being right in his predictions. Now, unless I've forgotten how to read the signs, you're not in a very gay mood, Angel. Well, no, I'm not. As a matter of fact, I, I'm very worried. Anything you'd care to put a name to? Yes, I was going to tell you anyway. Philip, my brother was killed yesterday. Oh, I'm sorry. How did it happen? He was found in the Thames near Teddington. Accident? No. He was the finest swimmer I've ever known. Suicide? He was much too self-centered to kill himself. No, I think he was murdered. Murdered? I'm sure of it. Well, what did the police say? Oh, they say it was an accident. Of course, the exact cause of death won't be established until after the inquest, but I'm sure that he was murdered. But, but have you anything to go on? No. Well, nothing definite. He led a rackety kind of life, I'm afraid. He was mixed up with some tough characters. I want you to help me to find out more about it, Philip. Me? Well, you're the only detective I know. Angel, I'm not a detective. You were in the Secret Service. I was attached to the American Office of Strategic Service. Not the same thing. Besides, the job was mostly rubber stamps, sitting behind a desk, writing reports. And what about the time you were dropped behind the German lines in Normandy? That you... was a rubber stamp job, I suppose. How did you know about that? Oh, I keep my ear to the ground. I've heard you described as the finest agent in the American service. So, I reckon that that more than qualifies you to find the person who killed my brother. Angel, I'm flattered that you should say all this, but honestly, the kind of work I've been doing for the past dozen years isn't half as exciting as it sounds. We're civil servants working in a rather uncivil atmosphere, that's all. Your modesty becomes you, Odell, but... Now, look, you'd be much better to leave this to the police. They really know how to catch murderers. Well, I'm going to find out all I can. Look, I'd like to help you, Angel, really, I would, but... I'm on my way to Dublin. The plane leaves at 5.30 tomorrow afternoon. That doesn't leave me time enough to solve anything more complex than a kid's crossword puzzle, now does it? You could try, wouldn't you? Hmm. What's that, um, what's that perfume you're wearing, Angel? <laughs> it's called indiscretion. You got a license to use it? Then you will help me. How can I help myself? Come along, then. I've got a cab waiting outside. Now, Angel, don't you think you'd better tell me more about your brother? Well, Ricky was what people call a waster. Handsome, charming, quite unscrupulous, and with an incredible dislike of work. He left home when he was 18, and even at that age he'd been mixed up in some unpleasant business. Was he your only brother? Yes. I didn't see him for years. I was never quite sure what he did. Oh, he'd appear every now and again, take me out and give me a wonderful evening. And then depart with my bank balance in his pocket. He was vain. But he had this bubbling charm and was quite irresistible. At least to women. Especially to Marilyn Peters. And who might Marilyn Peters be? Ricky's girlfriend. And that's who we're going to see. Yes, what is it? We'd like to talk to Miss Peters. Uh, she's not seeing anybody. I'm Heather McMara, Ricky McMara's sister. Oh. Oh, you'd better come in, then. And who's this? Mr. O'Dell, he's a detective. Now, look, I said... He's making inquiries into my brother's death. Oh, a nasty business, Mr. O'Dell. Handsome young fellow like that, too. Doesn't seem right, does it? Golden boys and girls all must, like chimney sweepers, come to dust. Pardon? Uh, did you know Ricky well, Mrs., uh, Mrs.? Oh, Cantaloupe, a silly name, isn't it? French for melon, you know, imagine. Of course, it's my husband's, not mine. My name's Pick Farthingill. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, Mr. McMara was here a lot on account of the way things were between him and Miss Peters. And, uh, how were they? Oh, very cosy, yes. Well, I'll take you to her room. Of course, she's been really upset since he went. Really upset. It's been heartbreaking to see her. Well, this is her room. Who is it? 
Lady and gentleman to see you, love. I told you I don't want to see anyone. The lady's Mr. Ricky's sister, love. Oh, all right. Ask him to come in. You can go in now. Thank you. This is Mr. Odell, Miss Peters. We wanted to ask you a few things about Ricky. Oh. oh sit down, won't you? Thank you. The place is a bit untidy. All right, Mrs. Cantaloupe, you can go. Oh, all right. Uh, but call me if you need me. Old harpy poking and prying. Well, what did you want? Well, uh, Miss McMara thinks Ricky was murdered, Miss Peters, and if he was, we owe it to him to try and find out who did it. What do you owe him? How do you know he wants you to interfere? I don't, but Miss McMara isn't satisfied, and as she's his sole remaining relative... I'm the only person who ever cared about Ricky. I'm the only one he ever trusted. No one else understood him. He hated you all. All of you. Perhaps we shouldn't have come so soon. I'm the only one who cared whether he lived or died. We'll go now. Perhaps we could come back later. No. No, don't go. I'll be all right. I'll help you if I can. Thank you. What do you want to know? When did you see him last? The day before he died. In the morning, he came to the shop where I work. Beaucaire's in Bruton Street. It's a beauty salon. And what happened? I was engaged with a customer at the time. Ricky suddenly appeared in the cubicle and put his arms around me and kissed me. A rather funny thing happened. Yes? What was it? I happened to glance in the mirror and I saw the customer's face. She was staring at Ricky. She looked as if she hated the sight of him. Did he recognize her? Yes. At least I think he did. He turned quite pale. Looked as if he was scared. I'd never seen him scared before. That's what was so funny. Did they speak? No. I thought she was annoyed because there was a man in the cubicle. She'd taken off her blouse, you see. So I pushed him outside and apologized. But it didn't do any good. She was in a frightful rage, threw three pounds onto the chair and rushed out without waiting to finish her facial. What happened to Ricky? He disappeared. After a bit, I went round to the little coffee shop in Bond Street where we often met. But he wasn't there. I never saw him again. Did you know the customer? No, never seen her before. She wasn't a regular. Can you describe her? Yes, I can. She made a big impression on me. She was exceptionally beautiful. I see a lot of beautiful women in that shop. But she really was outstanding. Young? She was in her early 30s, I'd say, with... Big cornflower blue eyes and jet black hair, a skin like silk without a blemish on it. Anything else, Miss Peter? She had money, plenty of it. She arrived at the shop in an enormous car with a chauffeur. She was wearing a mink worth at least 5,000. Heavenly. Mm. What did uh, Ricky do for a living? Well, he started to work for a bookmaker about six months ago, a man called Hector Gorman of Islington. Good job? I don't know. Sometimes he'd have as much as 300 pounds in his pocket. He didn't say where he got it, I suppose. No, but I assumed he got it betting. Did he seem worried about anything? <laughs> Ricky wasn't the sort to worry. One more thing. Uh, it's not a nice question, and you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Uh, do you think Ricky had any affairs with other women? Oh, I know he did. He was terribly attractive to women, and he knew it. He couldn't leave them alone. But he always came back to me. Well, thanks, Miss Peters. You've been very helpful. If you should think of anything you might think would be useful to us, you, uh, you know you can reach me at the Valida Hotel in Piccadilly. I'll be there until tomorrow afternoon. Here we are. One scotch, one dry martini. Thank you. Oh, sorry I was so long. Ah, the drinks have arrived. Mm. Cheers. Cheers. Well? Fine, thank you. What about it? What about what? The notebook you pinched from Marilyn Peters' room. Oh, uh, oh, that. Yes, that. Hand it over. Oh, dear. A man gets no private life with you around. Here you are. Hmm, diary. Who's in it? Ricky's. How do you know that? His name is in it. Oh. Doesn't seem to be much in it. Train times and 
A lot of money calculations. And look at the back under addresses. Hmm. There's only two names. Christopher Hampton and Martin Sorrowby. Those names mean anything to you? No. Should they? If you read the papers, they should. Christopher Hampton's a big racehorse owner, the kind they call a millionaire sportsman. And Sowerby is the editor of one of the most influential newspapers in Europe. What are they doing in Ricky's diary? That's what I would like to know. Oh, I'm glad you said that, Adele. Oh, why? Because you're going to find out. Am I? How? You're going to call on them. When? Tomorrow. Now, look, Angel, my plane leaves at 5.30 tomorrow afternoon. I'm leaving with it. Of course you are. It's very important. For years, I've longed to see the old home and my old mother. You haven't got a mother. Well, the old home, then. Now, you know how the Irish are about the old home. They write songs about them, even. You do want to help me, don't you, darling? Well, Angel, I don't know that I do. Well, you do want us to have a, a pleasant evening together, like the barman prophesied. Don't you, darling? Oh, dear. This is where she goes into her blackmail. All right, Angel, I'll do it. I'll go and see Hampton and Sorrowby in the morning. And uh, now, might we address ourselves to that pleasant evening we were talking about? The time's getting short. Oh, I didn't mean this evening. I'm going home. Now. You're what? And you ought to go to bed, too. But it's only half past nine. Well, you want to be fresh for Hampton and Sorrowby, don't you? Good night, Philip. Sleep well. Now, look, Angel. Heather, come back a minute. Did you have call, sir? Oh, it's you. Anything you want, sir? Here, uh, take this pound out and go out and go out and buy yourself a new crystal ball. A pleasant evening, he predicted. The next morning, there was one of those pea super fogs, the kind you usually see only in a Hollywood movie about London. Against my better judgment, I trusted myself out in it. Christopher Hampton lived in a turning off St. James's Street in a very gentlemanly service flat, full of sporting prints and period furniture. I sent in my name and scribbled, Concerning Ricky McMara, on the back of the card. Well, that opened his door like a charge of dynamite. I was ushered in so quickly it was embarrassing. Now, you couldn't actually smell horses when Christopher Hampton came into the room, but that was no fault of his clothes. He, he wore a canary yellow waistcoat with gilt buttons and narrow check trousers which looked like a pair of scotched rainpipes. His face was the color of crushed strawberries, and obviously he hadn't worked it up on soft fruits. He had a queer kind of voice which didn't go at all with his horsey appearance. It was soft and, and snaky like a length of oiled silk. It would have gone better with a Spanish inquisitor than with an English sportsman. He gave me a long searching look and then said, you wish to speak to me about someone called McMara? That's right. But I haven't the least idea who he is. No? No. He um, had your name in his diary. Oh, <laughs> I don't think that signifies anything, Mr. Odell. I'm quite a well-known person, you know. Are you a friend of Mr. McMara's? Of his sister. She uh, asked me to make inquiries about him. Has anything happened to him? Only that he's been uh, murdered. Oh. Nasty business, Mother. Yes. Yes, isn't it? Your medicine, Mr. Hampton. Uh, thank you, Parkin. Excuse me, Mr. Odell, my morning dose. Nerves, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, disgusting stuff. Uh, Parkin. Yes, sir? Uh, Mr. Odell is a detective. Yes, he, sir. You're a crime fan, Parkin. What sort of detective would you say he was? One of the erudite gentlemen who quote the classics and pick their teeth with a piece of jade. Oh, no, sir. Not that type at all. A more rough and ready type, perhaps? Definitely, sir. Popular with the more juvenile audiences. Thank you, Parkin. You may take the glass away. Yes, sir. Charming character. How do you get him to move so quietly? Do you uh, oil him? Parkin knows I dislike people who tread clumsily. Rough and ready people. I see. You're not going to tell me anything, then? I can't. I didn't know you're Ricky McMara. Sorry. Now, I'm afraid I'll have to turn you out. I hope you won't think I'm rude. I'm not interested in your manners, Mr. Hampton. I want to know what connection you had with Ricky McMara. I told you I didn't know him. Oh, of course, of course, sir. I forgot. Well, um, so long, Mr. Hampton. I have a plane to catch. Going far? Only across to Dublin. A wise move. What makes you say that? 
London's a depressing place in the fog. Also dangerous. Lots of accidents in a fog. Well, that was something, but not much. Clearly Hampton was lying in his teeth. He also gave me a not very thickly veiled warning to lay off. It was beginning to get interesting. Well, I had one real clue. The lady in the beauty salon. The lady in mink. From what I'd heard of him, Ricky wasn't the sort of boy to be scared of a woman. But he had been scared of her. I stored that away in my mind for future reference and went off down to Fleet Street to see Martin Sorrowby. The name of Ricky McMorrow did its stuff once more as an open sesame and I was wafted straight up into the present. There was plenty of green carpet in Sorrowby's office, although not quite enough to cover a football pitch. From the door, you could just make out his enormous walnut desk. On a fine day, that is. As near as I could figure, Sowerby was around about 40 and very cultured. He had the kind of face that goes with a glass of Russian tea. Disdainful, as if all the world was a bad smell under his delicate nostrils. When I came into his office and started on the long trek to the desk, he was looking out of the window with his back to me. He didn't turn round, but barked out in an edgy, high-strung kind of voice. What the devil are you doing here? I told you never to come to this office. Morning, Mr. Sorby. Quite a walk from that door, isn't it? Well, who are you? Odell. Philip Odell. But the commissioner said... I know. I wanted to see you in a hurry, Mr. Sorby. I've discovered the name Ricky McMara opens doors quicker than a shout of fire in this town. So I sent up his name. Uh, may I um, sit down? Well, what do you want? I represent McMara's sister. Are you a lawyer? No, I do this for love. Well, tell me what you want. I'm a busy man. On Thursday afternoon, Ricky McMara was found in the river. Really? Well, what's that got to do with me? That's what I hope you're going to tell me. I come of a long line of optimists. Uh, do, do you mind if I smoke? I didn't know, McMara. Look, Mr. Sorrowby, when a guy starts asking questions about a thing like this, he expects to get handed a lot of lies. That's in the cards, but let's keep somewhere near the rules and make some pretense at intelligence. Now, when I came in the door, you thought I was McMurdo. Don't let's try to fool ourselves that you were thinking of someone else. You're a detective, aren't you? Yes, all right, I'm a detective. But um, come to the point, William. I have a plane to catch. Your methods are very quaint, Mr. Odell. Rough and ready, popular with the juvenile audiences. Uh, what are you trying to cover up, Mr. Sarvey? Cover up? Well, your hands are trembling like a girl on her first date. Oh, uh, it's my nerves. I... I have to have treatment. Mm. You too, eh? Interesting. Well, what do you mean? Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, I'd talk if I were you. Well, I, I don't mind. I haven't anything to hide. No, of course you haven't. My relationship with Ricky McMara was strictly a la sourdine, if you understand me. Uh, no, I don't. Let's stick to the mother tongue, shall we? In plain language, Mr. Sorrowby, what kind of a relationship? He came to me and offered to provide material for a series of articles on petty crime that I was planning. He seemed to know what he was talking about, so I agreed. I insisted that he should never come to this office. Why? Well, some of the material he gave me was dangerous. I always met him away from Fleet Street. That's why I was so annoyed when I thought you were he. Are you trying to tell me you didn't know he was dead? I didn't know until you told me. I see. Well, that's not a bad story for the spur of the moment. Not at all bad. Why don't you believe it? Not a single word. And why not? You have a crime reporter on this sheet, haven't you? There are three crime reporters on this newspaper. Yet you prefer to trust information given you by a cheap chiseler like McMara. I don't know anything about McMara's murder. Who said anything about murder? But, but I thought you said... I said he was fished out of the river. Well, naturally, I assume... A thing no good journalist should do. But perhaps you're not a good journalist. All right, I'll go now. But um, one thing more. Do you know a man called Christopher Hampton? I know of him. Why do you ask? Well, I was wondering if you and he went to the same nerve specialist. I found him suffering from the jitters, too. Oh, never mind, don't answer. I'll go back to my hotel. Is there a chance of getting transport to that far-off door of yours?
Oh, Mr. O'Dell. Yes? Uh, a lady called to see you about half an hour ago. Oh. Was she uh, pretty? Well, that's not really for me to say, is it? I mean, every man to his taste. You know, you're a clever girl. You should go far. What did this young lady want? She wanted to talk to you urgently. She was in a terrible state. The manager showed her up to your room. Did you get her name? Yes, Peters. Marilyn Peters. Oh, well, I'll go right up. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I kept you, Miss Peters. I, I've been down to Fleet Street. I'm so glad you've come. Now, what's the trouble? I'm frightened. What's happened? I'm being watched. By whom? I'm not sure. After you've gone last night, I went to bed and fell asleep. I was wakened by the sound of someone trying to open my door. I'd locked it. Someone was turning the handle quietly. After a bit, they went away. I heard footsteps creeping down the stairs. Then I heard the front door go. I got out of bed and went over to the window. It must have been nearly dawn because there was some light in the sky. I saw a dark figure crossing the street. Man or a woman? Woman. She stood in the middle of the street and flashed a torch. After a bit, a big car drove up. I saw the woman for a moment in the headlights. Recognize her? Yes. It was the customer I was telling you about. The lady in mink. So, the beautiful lady in mink again, eh? I'm really frightened. I don't know what to do. Well, I think the best thing for you to do, Miss Peters, is to go to the police. Oh, no. Why not? I... I don't think I'd want to do that. Good sense. I know, but... I don't want to. I want you to help me. Where are you going when you leave here? To the shop. I'm due back in ten minutes. Will you go there? I think I'm going to stay in London. So, when you finish this evening, come here instead of going back to Sydney Street. All right? Yes. I'll think of something by this evening. Thank you. You're very kind. You were uh, very fond of Ricky McMara, weren't you? I was crazy about him. Crazy enough to have killed him if you looked at another woman, even in a mirror. Oh, no! No! I didn't kill him! That's absurd! No, of course you didn't. I'll, um, I'll see you this evening, then. That was Presenting Philip O'Dell, the first part of Lady in a Fog, a serial in eight parts by Lester Powell, with Robert Beatty as Philip O'Dell and Sheila Manahan as Heather McMara. Christopher Hampton was played by James Thomason, Martin Sorrowby by John Bennett, and Marilyn Peters by June Tobin. Production for the BBC by Martin C. Webster. <laughs>